let's talk about remote ID because unfortunately there's a lot of confusion being spread out there on remote ID. So in this video, I'll very quickly summarize three bullet points. One, what was the federal government's original ask with remote ID? Two, what was and what is AMA's position today on remote ID? And three, where's remote ID at today? This, this is the final rule on remote ID. In fact, that's my desk copy. You'll see it's highlighted, it's flagged, it's earmarked. We as an organization know that rule forward and backwards. It's our job to know that rule for you. That rule was published two years ago and it hasn't changed yet. There's not waffling on the rule. The rule is consistent with the advisory circulator that was recently published. And if you read the 2017 Aviation Rulemaking Committee report, you'll see this is really a national security issue. Homeland Security, Department of Defense, the Secret Service, local law enforcement wanted that beaver squawking remote ID. My Icon A5 complying with remote ID. The original request was even at little pit and pole. If I were to fly that pit and pole, the federal government should be able to point a device to it and say, ah, oh, that's Chad Budrow and act accordingly, which leads me to number two, what's AMA's position on this? What, what are AMA's thoughts? I'm here to tell you our position has not changed. Not only if you read old model aviation articles or blog posts, but if you read federal documents like the 2017 Aviation Rulemaking Committee report, which AMA was a part of, you'll see it's consistent with our comment in the NPRM. Our first ask was the exemption of traditional model aircraft. Model aircraft are low risk. They're not a national security concern. And if you see a line of sight model aircraft flying and you want to know who's flying, point your eyes down to the flight line. There's your pilot. That's our version of remote ID. Let's not overly complicate this. Leads me to number three. Where's remote ID at today? Because that put the FAA in the middle. Department of Defense saying everything should comply with the remote ID. AMA saying no, there are exceptions to include model aircraft. So the FAA spent three years. Rulemaking is a lengthy process. At the end of the day, the FAA leaned towards the hobbyist community and they made some compromises. And compromises don't make everyone happy, but the compromises are as such. One, if you fly at a flying site managed by a community-based organization like an AMA flying field, you can continue flying as you always have without the need for additional remote ID equipment. Get out there and fly. They argued AMA's right. Those are low-risk operations. So when the rule was published, we formed a team right away. We started working with our clubs to secure our clubs those protections. Now, I get it. Not everyone flies at a flying field. So the rule's clear. There's another option. You could put a little beacon inside a model aircraft like this icon. Pop it in when you're done, take it out, put in another model. So AMA went to work right away on behalf of the hobby. We worked with manufacturers, not only in the States, but globally to ensure those devices are affordable, simple, and not burdensome. But with all that being said, we're continuing to advocate on behalf of the hobby. We're continuing to work with federal government, national security agencies to find other solutions to make remote ID as least burdensome as possible to the hobbyist community. And we'll continue to provide fact from fiction. We'll continue to provide updates on remote ID. I encourage you to reach out anytime you have questions on AMA's efforts.